React India. All right. Um, before we get started, I just want to give a huge shout out to Manjula and Sahil and all of the volunteers here. It's been it's been an amazing conference so far. I've actually been trying to convince all of my teammates to come for the conference next year. So excited for next year already. <laughs> all right. Um, so hey everyone, um, I'm uh, Satya. So um, about a year ago, I joined the React team. Funnily enough, um, when I joined, I actually hadn't done a lot of UI work. I was mostly a compiler engineer. Um, I'd worked on V8, which is a JavaScript engine in Chrome. So this talk is kind of like my uh, React diary, um, building a compiler and realizing that what makes React good for building UIs is also what makes React good for a compiler. But let's chat about why a compiler is even on the table. So um, picture this component, right? Um, it gets two props, a list of videos, a title, spits out a couple of components. There's a heading and a video list. So in the code here, we're removing duplicates from the video list with a set, tossing that down to video list as a prop, and the title and the number of videos to the heading. Right? It's, it's, it's pretty straightforward React code. We've all written code like this. So this is a React tree view of our component right? Um, with the components and the props. The first time we render this component, we figure out what the unique videos are, we figure out the size, and then we pass that down as props, render the children component. This is uh, React as you know it. But consider what happens um, when we render this video tab component again, right, the second time. Now, but now, we pass the same list of videos, but a different title, right? So it's the, a different prop. Um, in an ideal world, we would we render just the heading component and not the video list component because the video list component doesn't really depend on the title, right? But React's default move is to re-render everything, which is generally okay, right? Like re-renders are super fast, but they can start adding up in complex apps. So how do we fix this? Well, React has a helpful API called react.memo. Wrap your component in it, and it only re-renders when the props change. So that's problem solved, right? Well, not quite. Because um, React uses shallow comparisons. And in JavaScript, objects have a referential identity, not structural. So even if the values inside the object may be same, the objects have different identity, so they're not equal, right? So they still can cause re-rendering. So in this example, we're always creating a new object for unique videos. It's always a new set on every render, right? So this is a new identity for this object. This is how JavaScript works. It's, it's not React's fault. Um, and we pass down this new object every time to video list. So react.memo doesn't know it's not a new, um, thinks that it's just a new object and it has to re-render this component. So React's got another trick up its sleeve called use memo. So it's like a cache for your calculations. You list out what it depends on and it only recalculates when those change, right? So here, unique videos is reactive on videos. So only if videos changes, unique videos is recalculated, right? Um, just change the heading, no need to redo unique videos. So now unique videos is reused across renders, right? So it maintains identity. So now our referential check kicks in and React does not re-render video list, right? Problem solved. Well, yes and no, because now we have good performance, but terrible DX, right? Check out this, this piece of code from the Blue Sky app. It's an open source app, and I just picked out a bunch of code. Um, we're using use callback and use memo left and right, like we're spinning plates. It's, but like, 
we're a UI developer, right? We want to focus on the UI, not solve the memoization puzzle. You're not building a data flow graph. You're describing the UI. This is exactly why React exists. So we thought on the React team, why not let the compiler handle the memoization, right? Imagine a world where you can just hit forget on use memo, use callback, and react up memo. How cool would that be? Um, but so when I joined the team um, and I heard about the compiler project, I was like, wait, what? Um, static analysis on JavaScript? That is, that's going to be very, very painful because JavaScript is, is very dynamic, right? You can do all kinds of crazy things, and it just, it's impossible to guarantee that the analysis is correct. And like, for me, this is especially terrifying because I'd come from working on V8, which has to be always correct and is a spec compliant JavaScript engine. And we didn't do any ahead of time analysis. It was all based on runtime feedback which we knew to be correct, right? So there's no st static analysis there. But here's the kicker. The magic ingredient making this compiler possible is React itself. We're talking hooks, immutability, all the React goodness. The compiler is dealing with components that are already playing by React's rules. React is what? makes the compiler possible. So we built this compiler called React Forget. It handles all memoization. So you can, well, forget about doing it yourself with use memo and use callback. Um, some of you may have heard of it already. Um, we've talked about it uh, a while ago. Uh, but we've come a long way since then. And it's shaping up nicely. If you're curious to hear about the nuts and bolts of the compiler, come like talk to me after the talk. Uh, but today, I want to talk about what makes React the secret sauce for the compiler magic. So on the, on the React team, right, we, we spent a lot of time thinking about how developers use our APIs, how we can evolve our APIs to build more complex and better UIs. In fact, like, fun fact, at Meta, we don't have a separate team for the React library, for the React runtime, for the React, or for the React compiler. We just have one big programming model team um, with, where everyone works on a bit of everything. So the programming model is the core of our uh, team. Well, we've seen this before, right? Um, at its core, React's all about the idea that the UI is a reflection of its state. When state or props change, that's when your component should do its thing. Um, the whole top-down re-rendering stuff, that's just implementation detail. Ideally, a component shouldn't have to re-render just because the pattern re-rendered, right? And even inside a component, we should hold off on rerunning computations unless their dependencies actually change. But let's get concrete, right? What's, what's the nitty gritty of this React programming model that makes this possible? Um, components are your React apps Lego blocks, right? They wrap up uh, the look, feel, and state all in one package. The magic word here being encapsulate. Thanks to encapsulation, you can shuffle around code in your component without any problem as a developer, right? When you're working in a component, you're in your own bubble. You don't have to think about what's happening in the rest of the app. It's just your component that you're editing. Um, enabling this, this kind of like local reasoning is a core part of our programming model. When we design new APIs, we assume the developer only has local knowledge about the code they're working on. So this, this encapsulation is, is a huge win for compilers, too. Um, the compiler can focus on one component at a time. Uh, it doesn't have to dig through your entire app 
before it can compile something. Um, in compiler's terms, this is called whole program analysis, and it's, it's generally slow. Plus, the, the compiler can now compile each component parallelly, right? Um, so that's, that's another big win for performance. But the cherry on top, we can roll out the compiler bit by bit, component by component, surface by surface, instead of waiting to compile the entire app at once. This is something I hadn't realized, um, but this was a huge, huge win uh, for us when we tr were trying to figure out a rollout strategy. Um, the, the React programming model has embraced immutability to a point where JavaScript can sometimes get in the way, right? Um, you've, you've likely heard the rules. Props are read-only. Um, you can tweak state with a setter function only, right? Um, but what's the advantage of this? Why, why go through this? Well, consider this example, right, where we modify the item prop directly to add a property. This breaks encapsulation. Now, if the parent component sent the same item to another child component, it's going to get that surprise URL property, right, whether it wanted it or not. And this is bad. Um, instead, the, the better approach would be to create a new value representing the URL and pass it down, right? The cool part about this, the compiler knows that props are a, re are a one way street, so it can auto memoize that for you. And by memoizing, we can avoid doing unnecessary work if item hasn't changed at all. So what else do we know about the, the programming model? Well, React is, is known for letting us build UIs declaratively, right? This was the old school imperative way. Um, you're glued to the UI, and you have to update it by hand. And it gets messy real quick, especially when your app gets complex. Plus, good luck reusing or testing this code. But with declarative code, you just tell React what you want, right? You describe the intent, and it handles the nitty gritty of updating the UI. So there's no more annoying bugs where the UI and state don't match up. This setup is, is a dream for compilers. First, um, they get the types easily, no sweat. Like the compiler knows what is a component type, what is a prop, what is a child node. Second, since, so we're passing an on-click handler as a prop, right? Um, so since the compiler knows we're passing it down as is without any funny business, the compiler can cache this before passing it down as a prop. So purity is another big uh, part of our programming model. Components being pure in React means they should always render the same output given the same input and state, right? When, when your components are pure, testing um, and debugging is, is super easy, right? Because your components become predictable, and predictable is good. Let's, let's consider this impure component, right? Like, it modifies global data, and this isn't ideal because it's the same global array that's being modified on every render. Instead, the better way to do this is to declare and use the array locally within the component. Now, this lets the compiler memoize the data for you, which is great. Um, hooks are like React's little he helpers, right? They simplify um, the reuse of stateful logic, and they make complex components way easier. Um, and, and they break down uh, complex uh, functions and components into smaller manageable functions. So this code is, is actually back from the React blog post that introduced hooks in 2018. So this shows how the power of the React programming model is retaining its utilities over time. 
But what does this actually mean concretely, right? <laughs> yeah, so um, diving into static analysis with classes can be a bumpy ride. First, in this component, um, by just looking at the render method, it's, it's impossible to know what the this refers to. That this keyword is like, like a wildcard. Um, its reference can change based on how this function is called, right? Um, so it's, it's actually hard for a compiler to know what this is referring to. In fact, when um, React took prepack, so prepack was our initial attempt at building a compiler for React. For a test drive, instead of like making things, um, slimming things down, the compiler bloated up the bundle size. The more it tried to reason about what this is, the more code it inlined. So it was harder to optimize class components. And then there's hot reloading, things like that, which don't really work well with classes uh, and make it less reliable. With hooks, there's, there's no more worrying about this. Everything we need is, is there def neatly defined in the component. Even when dealing with a custom hook, right? it doesn't have to be a use state, like a custom hook, the compiler recognizes it's a hook and can make some educated guesses, smoothing out the path ahead. So in the, we're living in the wild west of JavaScript. There's no type information, right? Um, so even small cues matter. Um, the use prefix is, is not just a name tag. It's a signal for the compiler, um, helping it spot what is a hook and triggering various optimizations. So now that we've seen how the compiler can analyze and optimize each of the React paradigms, let's, let's put it all together and view a component from the eyes of a compiler. Right? What does the compiler see when it parses and analyzes a component? Um, so we've got like a simple to-do app. It's, it's, it's a basic app that we've probably all written. Um, we have some state to store the to-dos and a filter. We run a fetch inside a use effect to get data from the server. And then the to-dos are filtered based on a condition and passed down to a list component. Right? Pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, nothing crazy here. Um, so first up, the compiler knows what hooks are. Right? The compiler understands what the use state hook does, and it figures out this is state. Um, the compiler knows about purity. It knows all side effects are inside a use effect. So it sees a use effect block, and it says, hey, all of these statements, um, they're side effecting. Now, this is the interesting part. Um, the compiler knows this is a new value that's being created and derived locally inside the component. Finally, the compiler also knows and understands each part of the JSX statement. So with all of this analysis, the compiler can memoize the derived value here before passing it down as a prop. The compiler can figure out this filtered to-dos depends on filter and to-dos and correctly memoizes it. Well, hopefully I've made it sound it's really easy, right? But um, React is just JavaScript underneath. You work with plain JavaScript values, right? You don't, um, you're still writing JavaScript, which means the compiler has to understand JavaScript. I said React makes the compiler possible. I didn't say it makes it easy. But what does that mean? Let's, let's consider this example. Just bear with me. Um, this, this looks contrived, but it's actually a simplified version of something we saw at Meta. And it's, it's valid React code. Right? It's, it's a component that takes two props, A and B. It derives an array with just A and passes it down as a prop. How do we compile this? Well, it's, it's, it's simple enough. right? We wrap the computation of x in a use memo. Um, yeah, this, this seems simple, but what about this? What happens if you reassign x to some other variable here? Here we are assigning x 
to Y and then pushing another prop B to the same array, right? At the end, X and Y are the same array. They refer to the same array. And the array now contains A and B, right? It has two values at the end of the render. How do we, how do, how do we compile this now? Previously, we just compiled, we memoized the computation of X separately, right? So if we did something like this, where we memoize x separately, y separately, it's, it's, it's not going to work, right? We can't just do this because this is incorrect, not because it is suboptimal, but because this is actually logically incorrect. So you could, this could lead to bugs in your code. Let's, let's dig into why this is logically incorrect, right? Let's step into what happens in each render. So this is the first initial render, right? The first memo runs because it's the initial render. So it's the first time we're running that computation. We create a new array. We push um, A onto that array. And uh, when this block finishes, we have um, X um, referring to a, an array that has value A, right? And then we cache this X now. And we recompute this block only if A changes. So the second memo block also runs in the initial render. Y points to the same array. We push B onto that same array, right? And, and now we cache Y. And we, sit and we um, so now Y depends on X and B. And this memo block is rerun only if X or B changes in the next render. Right, so at the end, we have what we what we wanted. Uh, we have an array that has A and B. This 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 looks correct so far, right? But what happens in the next render? Imagine B has changed, but A, A has not changed. A is the same that was in the previous render. So in this case, the first block doesn't run, right? Because A has is the same, and it's and it just reuses the cached value of X. And that x is still pointing to that old array from the previous render, which has a and b. But, and then we go on to the second memo block, right? Now, since b has changed, this reruns, right? And now we assign y to the, the, the old array that had a and b in it already. And then we push b onto it, which is the new b, right? So now, at the end of this, the array now has A, B, which is the old B from the previous render, and the new B from the current render, which wasn't intended, right? So the, the right way to do this is to memoize everything in one block. So a change in either A or B should blow out the previous value and create a new one. But this is, this is still a simple example, right? Like, imagine if there are conditionals, if there are loops, if there are closures in here. It gets complicated very quickly. This kind of compiler analysis is called alias analysis. And alias analysis is a huge topic in compiler theory. In fact, the alias analysis that we have in Forget is more complex than what we did in V8. Um, but, but this is just scratching the surface. There's several other bits of compiler analysis in Forget to make it work with vanilla JavaScript. So when we set out to um, solve these problems, we went in wanting to solve developer problems. We didn't go in wanting to build a compiler. We looked at changing everything from first principles, right? But we ended up doubling down on the existing programming model. And we're like super excited to share this approach where developers don't need to change anything. Their, um, their way of thinking and can continue using everything they already know and love about React today. Instead, we'd like to absorb all the complexity in the compiler, right? And build a compiler that can improve the developer experience 
and simply lift the baseline performance of all React apps. The, the compiler is still a work in progress. It, it's not done yet. Um, but over the coming weeks, we're going to talk a lot more about Forget. Um, for example, my teammates are going to be talking about Forget at React Advanced in a couple of weeks. So watch out for that. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's all I have to share for today. But if you want to know more about the compiler, uh, come find me after the talk. Thanks, everyone.